Hi, hello, and welcome to Sportsian's new mini series, The Umpire's Call. This is the first episode of a seven part series. We are going to wear the umpire's hat and take a look at the life of an umpire, little known rules of cricket, discuss about interesting situations the umpires have faced in over the years, and much more. To help me dissect all this, I have with me Mr. Vivek from Melbourne, Australia. Vivek has had umpiring experience for over 12 years. He's, in, he's a Cricket Australia accredited umpire who has been in Cricket Victoria panel for the past seven years. He also runs a YouTube page called Sport Arbitrator. Not to forget, he's a big cricket fan of uh, Steve Waugh and he has also named his son after him. Welcome to the show, Vivek. Hi, Vignesh. How are you? How is everything? I'm doing great, Mr. Vivek. So, uh, Vivek, I'm really intrigued by this. Can you explain the journey about how you became an umpire? Of course, certainly. But I just want to make a request. Please don't call me Mr. Vivek. Okay, Vivek is fine. <laughs> okay, so sure, my, yeah. my journey as an umpire. So, I uh, studied in Chennai. I'm a Chennai boy. I did all my schooling and education in Chennai. And I moved to Melbourne in the year 2008. And it was a time where the, the economic uh, meltdown was happening. There was not uh, much jobs going around. So um, as fate would have it, I, uh, I did what I knew best, that is uh, play cricket, making friends uh, through playing cricket. And I had an unfortunate incident where I had an ankle um, um, tear. Uh, it was a ligament tear in my ankle that kept me away from the sport for about six months. And then on my comeback, I started playing and then I used to get injured on a frequent basis. So that is when my coach suggested that I take up uh, umpiring uh, so that I'm still in tune with the game and I can uh, still be involved and also helps me with the recovery uh, of my injury. So that's how it all began. And once I started umpiring, I started uh, uh, falling in love with it. And uh, from then on, um, I decided to pursue a different um, um, hobbies to, to say and um, yeah and then I tried uh, to try and get myself certified and uh, see uh, where that journey would take me so yeah that's uh, that's how it all started oh it was a really you know I can say roller coaster right and Vivek, I would uh, like to ask you I'm very intrigued by what you said you said that uh, an injury forced you to become an umpire but we all know that uh, fitness is also very important for umpires. Can you tell me what kind of the fitness routines that the umpires do and also how do they practice? I mean, when a bowler wants to practice for a Yorker, he keeps a shoe of, uh, of, of a batsman on the crease and tries to bowl at the shoe. How do umpires practice the leg before decisions, for example? What kind of practice do they do to you know, sharpen their focus? Yeah, that's uh, something that's uh, very interesting. Um question uh, because not many people uh, talk about uh, from the umpire's uh, perspective how they prepare themselves for games you know um, it's generally the focus is on the players and so it should be but uh, umpiring um, to the quality of umpiring actually gives the players a very good experience so a good a umpire can create a positive atmosphere and let, let the players enjoy themselves at the, at the field. So um, I would say definitely there is a lot of uh, planning that goes into becoming an umpire. And um, I would like to use the quote, um, you know, uh, failing to prepare is like preparing to fail. Besides the, the fitness and the, the diet and the hydration levels that the umpires need to be uh, wary of, uh, there is a lot of uh, planning that goes into uh, mirror practice and uh, mental imaging. Now, mirror practice is something that uh, umpires at uh, competitive levels do. And it, it's uh, basically standing in front of a mirror, practicing your signals and practicing any uh, verbal or non-verbal communication. Uh, when you see verbal communication, sometimes it could be a day, uh, it could be a rainy day and uh, the umpires uh, may have to go out and do frequent inspections about the pitch and uh, the ground conditions and they would uh, then have to communicate that to the team captains. So uh, mirror imaging helps you practice those uh, conversations with captains or communications. Uh, the other aspect is the mental imaging. Mental imaging is a positive reinforcement um, that is um, that you uh, you know train your mind um, uh, about uh, an event that has not been so 
uh, positive. For example, everyone makes mistakes and when an umpire makes a mistake on the field of play, and we do not have the time to reflect on the mistakes because if we start reflecting on the mistake we and dwell in a mistake, we are going to make more mistakes through the course of the day. So the important thing as an umpire is to forget and move on. So that uh, is a very good life lesson that umpiring teaches us. Like uh, you make a mistake, you forget about it and start focusing on the next ball. And you don't want to be dwelling in your mistake. But when you finish the game, and you've got time to sit down and reflect on, on the game. And uh, if you believe that you have committed a mistake, then it's time to do mental imaging, uh, which is like, uh, like reminiscing the event in your mind. But this time, um, you, you kind of reminisce uh, as if the event um, is more, is, uh, has a positive outcome. So if you made a mistake with a caught behind, you reflect and reminisce about the incident, but this time you create a positive um, image in your memory, um, like, uh, like that, uh, that uh, you had uh, given the right decision. So you, you try to recreate a negative impact event into a positive event and try to um, uh, store that in your, in, in your brain. So that's, uh, this, this actually helps the subconscious mind to deal with a similar event in the future. So when a similar event happens, um, because of this positive imaging and positive reinforcement, uh, you are in a very good mental space to be able to um, execute the, the correct decision. So these techniques, mental imaging and mirror imaging um, uh, could uh, help umpires to stay focused and to be in a better, men better mental space uh, to be able to execute their skills. Uh, Vivek, I also have one more question. The game moves at a very fast rate because the fast bowler comes in bowls at 150. Definitely going to be a challenge for umpires to number one, track the no ball, number two, track whether it's pitching in line, whether it's going to hit the stumps. So what kind of any special uh, practices uh, do the umpires take to, you know, uh, sharpen their skills on leg before wickets? Yeah, another very good question. Um, so uh, this is something that, uh, you know, as uh, when I started my journey as an umpire, which, you know, I didn't have a sort of a plan to counter that, you know, once you get to a stage where you're doing competitive umpiring and uh, players are now bowling at uh, faster speed, like, you know, close to, I wouldn't say 150, but at least close to 135 and, you know, um, maybe 140. So that is when, you know, you, you, you look at like, you know, you don't have enough time to watch the no ball and also uh, watch what's happening at the business end. Like, for example, uh, then, you, you know, you need to counter and get, you know, uh, form a technique where uh, you're able to even watch the no ball and also know what's happening at the other end. So what happens is uh, I had a chat with my um, umpire's manager and he came up with a kind of a technique and uh, what the technique is like, you know, uh, as an umpire, your head has got to be still, right? So uh, just like how the batsman, when he's watching the ball, ball from the bowler's hand, he's, uh, his head is still. Uh, likewise, the umpire's head's got to be still. And when you're focusing on the no ball, only the eyeball moves down. Like you move your eyeball down to watch the no ball. And then the next instant, it's again back and um, you're watching what's happening at the um, business end. So uh, the, the reason for this is if you're going to be moving your head down and up and someone's bowling at 150, uh, you don't have time to, you know, you just miss the ball. You don't have, by the time you go look up, the ball's already gone. So, uh, so this technique actually helped me to um, combat that um, you know, the, the scenario where, you know, you're, you're actually watching the no ball, moving your eyeball and also watching. And, and then we're also focusing on what is happening at uh, the other end. And the other important thing is, uh, or important technique uh, that umpires generally follow is like um, fixing a target at the, uh, at the striker's end. So usually the target would be the middle stump or halfway um, through the middle stump or the bottom of the middle stump. So I would generally focus on the bottom of the middle stump. So that is my target. So I'm always looking there and, and I don't follow the ball out of the bowler's hand. So and I, I, my, my focus is the target that I fixed, the bottom of the middle stump. Now I allow the ball to come into my zone. So that way I pick up uh, where the ball's pitching through my peripheral vision. 
So my peripheral vision takes care of where the ball is pitching. And all I'm doing is just focusing on the middle stuff. So when I'm like, when I allow the ball to come into my zone and I've got that extra bit of second to, um, to make a, uh, informed decision. Whereas if I'm like following the ball from the bowler's hand, you know, I, I'm actually following the ball. The ball is before me. And as soon as the ball makes an impact, and then I have to now work out in my mind, you know, where it's pitched and where is it going to go, where the impact is and where it's targeted, where it's heading. So uh, by, I, what I do is by focusing on the target and by allowing the ball to come into my zone, I eliminate all those equations. So what I all I do is um, uh, as soon as the ball makes an impact, I know that I'm already there even before the ball has hit the, you know, the batsman's pad or um, uh, the point of impact. So I, it just makes it a lot easier to, to sum up and uh, make a well-informed decision. So that's uh, one thing um, generally the professional umpires uh, do well um, to, oh. yeah, to come back to uh, you know, the, the issues that you, you, you brought up. Wow, that was amazing, Vivek. So basically, now we know that umpires are more like chess players. You know, they're always one step ahead of the of the cricket ball. Uh, so that was great. Okay, Vivek. Now you tell me, uh, how do umpires cope up with so many changes uh, in the you know formats? There is a separate rules for Test cricket. There are separate rules for One Day cricket. Separate rules for T Twenty. So many power plays. So many rules in so many power plays. So how do they you know cope up with so many changes? I guess um, uh, that's, I would say that's all part of the, the job. And uh, I would like to go one step back uh, before I answer your question in saying that uh, there is a distinction that uh, we all must know uh, between the laws of cricket and what we call uh, a playing condition. Okay, the distinction is uh, the laws of cricket is the, uh, is the Bible, is the source from where um, the laws and you know the various modes of dismissals, etc. The why, what's the uh, the rule uh, about dead ball, no ball? So all the overarching laws, uh, they are put. They are all uh, in a book. It's called the laws of cricket, and the custodians of the laws of cricket are the MCC, right? Now, what happens is uh, when you have a um, any local competition or even the ICC, for example. So they derive the laws of cricket, they use the laws of cricket, and they make uh, modifications to the laws of cricket. And we call this a local playing condition. So the ICC, they don't, they're not, they don't follow the MCC laws of cricket uh, in its entirety. So what they do is they use um, the laws of cricket and they make changes such as like what time the play starts, uh, how many overs they are playing and uh, the power plays, the, the free hits, for example. So what would be the field restriction? Uh, so first 10 overs, you got two fielders outside and then you got like four fielders outside for the next 30, 30 overs. And then uh, in the last 10, you got five fielders outside for the, you know, that, that's the power play. So all these things come under the local playing condition. But when you go to the laws of cricket, the power plays, the field restrictions are not mentioned there. So, so it is important and it's crucial to understand this difference between the laws of cricket and the local playing condition. Now, when we go back to your question about uh, different rules for different um, uh, formats, it's, uh, it's basically, again, all uh, the local competitions. So the ICC, um, which is now the, uh, like the governing body for cricket operations, so they come up with these local playing conditions. With, and they, the idea is to make cricket more exciting, you know, and that's where they, you, you have this concept of uh, field restrictions and um, so the power plays by, you know, where they want to allow the batsman to score freely during the first 10 to make it more exciting. And then you get free hits for no balls and uh, th those sort of things. And uh, the same, likewise, in 2020, you've got like uh, the first six overs of power play and then, uh, you know, the free hits and same. Um, and then it, and the, the also the other thing, uh, the differences between the, the laws of cricket and the, the local playing condition is the, and I would say the, the bouncer rules. For example, uh, in, uh, in the, in the, in, when you watch in TV, you got the ICC, um, you know, the bouncer rule, for example, in a, in a test match, you're allowed to bowl like two bouncers in an over, over the shoulder. But if you look at the laws of cricket, uh, it doesn't specify anything about the number of bounces you could bowl in an over. All it says is um, as long as the, if the umpires think it's too dangerous by repetition 
uh, by the height or and the relative taking into account the relative skill of the player, the umpire can call a no ball at any time. Even if it's a second bouncer, the umpire can still call no ball because uh, if they feel that uh, the striker doesn't have the skill to cope with the with the bouncer, that could be a dangerous ball, even though the bowler has bowled just a second bouncer. So all these things, um, it, it all you know, comes from the distinction between the laws of cricket and the, the local playing condition. So what we generally watch on TV is the local playing condition. And every competition um, has this local playing condition to suit their, um, uh, to the environment that they are playing in. Uh yeah, uh, now that you said that, I could recall a very interesting incident. So it happened in a T20 match in New Zealand. So what happened is, 12 runs were required of one ball and the batsman was Andre Adams. So basically all the bowler needed to do was bowl a legitimate ball, but he bowled a no ball which was over the shoulders and it went for an outside edge and it went for four. But here, there is a small change. Like you said, uh, the rules are differing. So in New Zealand, at the time what happened is, in their T20 league, uh, no ball was given two runs. So basically, it was a four plus two without the ball being considered, and it was six from one ball. And the very next ball was the free hit, which Paul Adams hit for six. So basically, uh, sorry, Andre, Andre Adams. Adams. So yep. basically, Andre Adams, yeah, he won the match from 12 to win of one ball, which is an almost improbable situation. It was amazing talking to you, Vivek. Viewers, do stay tuned for the next episode where we will be talking about the evolution of DRS. I hope you enjoyed this video. Do like, share, subscribe to Sports GN and Cricket Arbitrator and we will catch you in the next video.